It is a brand new episode of Flyers Daily for Monday, the 25th. It's Thanksgiving week. What? Mm -hmm. Flyers Daily presented by Ticketmaster. Make more memories live. And joining us for this Monday uh, for a BAFO episode. It's award-winning. It's chart-topping. It's Mondays with Meltzer. And it's Bill Meltzer from NHL.com and PhiladelphiaFlyers.com. You ready for uh, the, the bird coming up on yes. Thursday, Bill? Yeah, sure am. One, one, I always love Thanksgiving from the time I was a kid. So Me too. Yeah, I was looking forward to it. <laughs> there, it's weird because a lot of people want to look past it and go to Christmas as a kid, yeah. but there's a warmth in Thanksgiving that I've always loved. Oh, and for it, sure. Yeah. And for it's, sure. It's, a, it's always been a big date on the hockey calendar as well. Yes. With uh, American Thanksgiving, if you're in the play, you know, I think that maybe that's shifting a little bit these days. Yeah. Um, but let's get right into it, Bill, because um, the homestand is now four games in, one remain. That's tonight against the Vegas Golden Knights. That'll wrap it up. And really a win tonight, maybe tonight's game really determines if it was a successful homestand or not. Flyers had a tough week. They lost to a couple of good teams, Colorado on, on Monday. Then they lose to Carolina after playing two good periods and then really kind of got flattened in the yeah. third period. But on Saturday, let's get right to the top story here. It's Matthew Meechkoff, Bill. Um, once again, this kid's got a flair for the dramatic. I know that uh, in the NHL, the most career OT goals as a teenager – He's got two already, the one against Ottawa and the one uh, in the last game. And you know, Kovalchuk had three. Nash had three and Crosby had three. This is pretty rarefied air company. Yeah, and, and it's not really a big surprise. I mean, one thing that's kind of been evident kind of from the get-go here has been that the deeper you get into games, he seems to get better as games go along. Yeah. And, and uh, I mean – yeah, he, he's made for he's made for the three on three overtime anyway. Give him give him space to make a play, and you know, and it was a beautiful goal. And can't can't overlook that that gorgeous, crazy saucer pass from Konechny. Come and, on, that was ridiculous. Yeah. That pass, it was so great. And, and you can't overlook actually what Couturier does too, and kind of wiping yeah. the guy out of the middle yeah. uh, to make that lane open. Uh, you know that I said on the post game show with Brian Smith, I said. Go to a Flyers practice, a Flyers training center that are free. You can go there, hang out, watch the team practice, but get there early. If the practice is posted at 11, get there at 1045, watch the players come out. And it seems like they're out there just kind of fiddle farting around, right? Yeah. That's when they're working on those little sauce passes and those little, yeah. those little things like that. And then you see it translate into the overtime and really uh, that deft touch that Konechny had there. Uh, was the reason why one of the big reasons why they scored the goal. But Bill, why do you think Mishkov gets better in games? Is it kind of him learning his opponent a little bit and where they may be vulnerable? Because a lot of his success comes from is him instinctually going to certain places on the ice. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I I do think that, uh, and and we'll see as they play some of these teams a second time. Yeah, and maybe, not, maybe not Chicago so much. They play them one more time, but. You know, as he sees some of these divisional opponents, a third or a fourth or second time or whatever the case might be, we'll see what kind of a mental book he has on these teams and players he's playing against. Everything's still new to him, you know, for, for, really for the most part. But I, I, I do think that there's a there's a piece. The other, the other part, too, is that, that I just think he just kind of ratchets up his own intensity level. Yeah. I mean, here we see the overtime winner, Bill. Sandheim goes down, and then that pass from Konechny, it, from that far video, looks like it's just an along the ice pass. But when you see the slow mo on the side of the net, which I don't have, unfortunately, uh, you see the little sauce because the, yeah. the the Chicago defenders got the the the, the whole stick down. Yeah, the yeah. Shaft he, goes right over it. Yeah, if he if he didn't saucer that, it's not getting through. So I mean, look what Couturier does here. He migrates to the middle, and look, he just wipes that guy There's right. A, yeah, yeah. If he wipes him out. That guy can't now defend the cross ice pass. Yes, it, it's yeah. an absolutely beautiful play and, and great execution uh, in overtime by the Flyers there. But Bill, they don't even get to the overtime if um, there's a play. Couturier finally. By the way, um, I'd like to introduce you to Frank Vesna Morazic in the first two periods of the game. Who the heck <laughs> that guy in that? Yeah. He was unreal. <laughs> um, but you know, Peter Morazic, I thought was excellent in the yes, game. Yes, he was. Yeah. But they finally dent him. In in the third period, when Couturier scores, uh, but the thing that I thought was really interesting about it was that you know they're up two to one, and now you're in a volatile part of the game, yeah. and Matt Vemichkov makes a defensive play yes. that I was stunned by, and we'll show that because he's deep here in the zone, 
and look at him bust it. Look at him, and yeah. Mitigate the pass. Yeah, just just put his head down and and just bust it all out to back check there. And it was crucial because look at you know look at the way this attack is developing. It's a two on one. Yeah, for, it goes to the guy puts, and, and leaves the take, stick out. Yeah, and take away take away a passing lane there. Then then Kolosov knows how to play it, and, and the other guys can get back. I mean that that was such a such a, a critical play there at, at a crucial time. And it's something that, that easily gets lost in a game. I'm, I'm glad you're you're mentioning it when we did uh, I did the post game five. Uh, you have yeah. Flyers game wrap up. I mentioned that too because one of the one of the five things today was uh, you know going in the preview was uh, Michkov uh, against Bedard, and uh, so there weren't really a lot of Bedard highlights to talk about in the game. Hit a post and that was about it. But uh, for Michkov, I mean that that to me was his highlight until the until the winner. Yeah. I mean, I didn't, I didn't think he could skate that fast bill because yeah. you've really made up a lot of ground. Um, he showed a lot of bursts, but he, he got no chance, no matter how fast he is. If he doesn't make the read right away, yes. and the fact that he's reading the other end of the ice, I think is a good thing. Um, it was the first matchup for Mishkov and Bedard. And, and maybe this is more storyline for us, but Mishkov kind of embraced it after the game. Yeah. And I know Connor Bedard stopped by the locker room and those two, uh, they have a really good relationship. Um, but and I think that's great. I I saw the pictures of him talking with Bedard outside the locker room, and like I was buzzed by it. Like I think that's awesome. Oh yeah, and and and, and clearly there's just so much respect between those guys. Where mm-hmm. I mean they're they're obviously I mean they've been prodigies from long before they were draft eligible. Their names are out there, so they they kind of have a a little bit of kinship there because. They're one of a very small group, you know. Her Crosby's name well before the draft, right? Yeah. Eric Lindros is named well before, well before his draft year. But just very, very few players are like that. Uh, John Tavares was another one. Yep. You, you hear well ahead of the draft, but you know their names have been out there for so long, and they, they played against each other actually in the U.S. in Frisco, Texas, uh, the the under eighteen worlds. Um, you know, back when I, I think Mitchell was still 16 at that, or I guess yeah, he was 16. Um, yeah, it's 2021. Yeah. So you, they they played against one another on the international stage. Unfortunately, given the double IHF ban of Russia, it was the last, the last time they played against each other in the international stage. But, uh, you know, they were kind of, kind of measuring, measuring stick against each other for a long time. Of course, it worked out to the Flyers' benefit, but for – for quite a while, it was which one was going to go first and which one was going to go second, right? Yeah, Mishkov and, was the Russian Connor Bedard, and Connor Bedard was the American or North American uh, Mavi Mishkov. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just, just just in terms, yeah. So, you know, and and obviously round one goes to Mishkov, but it's round one of many, many, many over yeah. the years. Even, you know, yeah, yeah, they're only going to play each other twice during the regular season. Those those are going to be games to circle in the calendar. Those should be some. Some great matchups, and who knows what the future holds for that. Yeah, I, I thought it was – like that game gave me a ton of jump. I, I just love the energy, yeah. and I, I thought they played good in the first two periods, Um, and uh, my thing was to kind of stick with what you're doing. Yeah. If you get goalied, you get goalied, but you stick to your process, and they stuck to it. Um, Sean Couturier getting a goal I think is a big deal. Noah huge. Cates getting a goal, getting two goals from centers, nice. and that's Couturier's only goal outside of the hat trick game against yeah. Minnesota. And Cates gets on the board. Did you notice who was screening Peter Morazic on the Cates goal? That would be Cam York. Yeah, uh, yeah, he was he was all the way all the way up on the play. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, standing tall provided a good screen, looking like net front guy for goodness sake. But have you noticed a bit more of the Flyers, you know, activating offensively down below the top of the circles from the defenseman more than ever? Yeah, they they they've been doing that. I mean, it, it, it's kind of started uh, with Sandheim. Yeah, but uh, other guys are doing. You, you see, you know, I mean, uh, not 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 as much today in his first game back. He had some kind of issues, but but you've seen uh, Emil Andre do that a little bit too. Yeah. Um, Line so assists on the Couturier goal. And that that yeah yep. yeah. Um, so I mean, it's kind of a necessity in today's game yeah. being able to have your defenseman jump in. Um, it, really. Really, just the way the, the a lot of goals develop. I mean, a lot of it comes from, you know, you, of course you have to have that that third forward up high. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, you're in a, a world of hurt. I mean, the the first goal against was a four on two that became a three on one the other way. Yeah. Um, you know, 
you, they had York pinching on it, and it wasn't his fault. The play went awry because it was a pass by connecting. I think it, it, it uh, went the off the tip. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's going to happen sometimes. I, I think in the same situation, I'd still want my defenseman joining the rush on that. So, Yeah, you got to remain aggressive. That, that puck hits a tip it in the heel. If it moves – an inch to the middle part of his skate, he can pull it out of his feet. Yeah. But when it's in your heel, all your pressure's on your heel, you can't pick a puck with your heel like you can the middle or towards the toe uh, of the skate blade, and it ended up in the back of their net. Um, let, let's go back to the Colorado and uh, the Carolina game. You know, the Colorado game, I thought the Flyers really came on in the third period, and in the Carolina game, the Flyers got it handed to them in the third, the third period. Yeah. Th- and that just kind of shows, Bill, I, I think we're always looking kind of to measure this season and we're at the quarter pole that there's still a lot of, a long way to go here. Um, And you know, those teams, if you don't play a full 60, you're not going to win. And like Carolina, you're not going to outwork Carolina. Like you can beat some good, better teams if you outwork them, but Carolina doesn't let you outwork them, especially right now. No, no, it's a characteristic. I guess you'd expect of a team coached by Rod Brindamore. It's not shocking. Um, they are, they are such. They, I mean, they are the NHL's number one puck possession team and have been what four years, three, four years running now. Yeah, um, you know, so you, you're not going to outpossess them in a game. Um, the the Flyers really had a really good first period and, and not a bad second period. I mean, and on top of that, they they got rewarded with the only goal uh, of the period. Um, so you, you're going into that third period kind of the way you, you want to, and then they just got it handed to them. I mean, they 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 never had the puck, and you know, when they did, they three, turned it over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That I mean, well, turnovers killed the Flyers in that game. But yeah. you could basically trace every goal to to a turnover that ended up ended up in their net. And I mean, I thought the Flyers played a, a you know a good game against Chicago. But I mean, a team like Chicago, you might get away with a little bit of that. Yep. Um, but you're not going to get away with that, Caroline. Caroline, you're not going to get away with that uh, against Vegas you know, tonight either. That, that's a, that's another you know good and, and it's, a, it's a heavy team too, heavy and skilled. Yeah. So that's a that's a you know a double threat. I'll be really interested to see how the Flyers manage this one. Yeah, and and Vegas is a team off to a good start, like Caroline as well. I think Caroline is one of those teams I like. I look at. And there's not that superstar talent. I, mean, I know Natchez is off to a great start, uh, but there's not that superstar talent that you key on. Like if you're facing McDavid or, you know, you've got the Leafs and you're going against Matthews and, and Nylander or Marner. Um, but I, I think that there's a cumulative effect to their game because a couple of reasons. One, it's so detailed all the time. Yeah. Their structure very rarely breaks down. So that's suffocating. And then they come at you in waves with so much depth, I think that that's one of the reasons why they the cumulative effect they wear teams out in the third. Uh, you, you see it over and over again. You saw, you saw the previous time yep. when they played the Flyers. I mean, the, the the game that they won in the final twenty nine seconds. I mean, there was a cumulative effect. That was that was the game. Where I think the shot attempt differential was eighty six thirty six something something along those lines. Yep. Flyers had sixteen uh, shots on goal, and, and actually, yeah, just just sixteen on net. And it was it wasn't that big of a you know, it wasn't that big of a difference this time from the last time. Yeah. Um, they, they they will just wear you down, and um, it, you have to be so clean with the puck because every failed clear, even if you're not scored there, you, um, I, I think, well early in the game I think the Flyers had a, I, I think Sandheim was on the ice. What was it almost three minutes? Yeah, second yeah. shift of the game. Yeah. So you know you. you Go through that, and maybe you survive that shift and, and live the fight with the next shift. But if you're you're playing that way, you will feel it by the third period that that's why they're a team that can put you know, put a team away. And as you said, they're relentless. Once they yeah. well, once they get going, they're relentless. Especially after a long change second period when they can yeah. really just put the screws to you. Um, but what have you seen out of Helgi Granz? Because you know Andre comes back into the lineup. So does Cam York. But Helgi Granz doesn't come out of the lineup. Zamula yes. and Johnson come out of the lineup. Uh, and Anthony Richard sent back to the Lehigh Valley Phantoms. You know, he performed really well. There's just not a spot right now with the roster situation. But Granz, to me, Bill, looks just very natural. I don't see a guy out there thinking. I mean, his first two assignments, hey, deal with Colorado, Ranton and McKinnon yeah. and McCarr. And then, then you get Carolina. 
but I don't think he's looked overwhelmed at all, and he's he looked very instinctual in his play. Yeah, he, he, I, I think he's been pretty darn good, and particularly, you know, I, I thought especially the Colorado game. Yeah. Um, you know, he he just um, two good scoring chances. Yeah, two 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 good scoring chances of his own. Um, you know, well, he picked up his first assist too. Yep. Um, moves the puck well. I mean, you could see why he was picked in the top thirty-five in his draft class. He was an yeah. early second-round pick by LA. The, the question with Helge has always been: uh, Does one mistake become two? That kind of thing. The the development cycle of a defenseman. So, sure. you know, he had a he had a good first pro season in the, the American League. Um, a not so good second year, and then the trade came to Philly. Um, and then he had a lot of injuries last year. Like, so he, he missed a significant amount of time in the middle of the season. Um, but he has all the physical tools. He's a Long. big kid. Yeah. Yeah. Big, big, uh, you know, kind of raw boned, uh, skates well. He, he has a lot of tools. It's just a question of consistency with him. Um, and, you know, one thing I, I could say too, uh, I think the Phantoms have done a good job between Andre and, and Granz. Even even last year when a guy like Belpedio came up, he didn't they didn't skip a beat. He came, you know, he's an older defenseman, but he came in and he helped during the period of time that he was he was there. Um, uh, I think some credit there goes to, to Jason Smith. Yep, uh, in getting guys ready to play up here, and then then when you're up here, you know you have access to to Brad Shaw, and Brad Shaw's one of one of the best defensive coaches anywhere in the NHL. Yeah, I've been really impressed with it, with his play, and I, it yeah. just like makes me wonder, like, okay, you know, these are a little bit more complicated than forwards because there's less spots, yeah. and you kind of start to go, well, I look, I know for sure, and I had Lappy on last week, uh, he didn't expect to see Emil Andre again, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, at you know, you look at obviously you have York and Sandheim and uh, Ristolainen, and we'll see if maybe there, he's a trade target uh, through at some point of this season. I think he's played well. Um, obviously, Drysdale out hurt right now. You know, where does Zamula fit into this? Where do some other guys kind of fit into this? We had Nick Sealer. You know, I, I, it's getting a little crowded uh, yes. back there all of a sudden. And, you know, you don't want to give up on a defenseman too early. And you don't want to make a trade because it's crowded because that can change really quick. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, look at what happened to the defense score this past couple of weeks, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's several. Um, Injuries seem to happen that way, you know. It's, yeah. uh, you go a while, and the, the Flyers have had bad luck with defense injuries so far this year. Anyway, if, if you if you look at the blue line core, um, Zamula's a little bit banged up too, although he probably could have played. But uh, you know, Sandheim has been healthy. Ristolainen, after a lot of injuries last year, he, he's been healthy. But everybody else remember, remember Sealer started out the year injured, and then. Uh, York missed a lot of time, just came back on, on Saturday, uh, you know, and, and uh, Drysdale is on IR. So they, they've they been pretty banged up on the blue line. Uh, yeah. and, and considering that it's been patchwork to a degree, um, and, and uh, I mean, Sandheim's played with the, several different partners who play pretty different style games, and he hasn't skipped a beat. Whoever he's been with, he's, he's been, been really astonishing. Good. Yeah, Billy, he's, he's swapped partners, sides. He's played, I think, yeah. with five different partners this year. He's played with Andre. He's played, obviously, with York. He played with Ristolainen, <laughs> moving to the left side. I mean, the guys play with just about everybody. I mean, we saw what, how he started last year. And we said, okay, that's probably the ceiling if he can maintain that through a year. But just, Billy, he's put his head through the, 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 the tile ceiling here. Like, he's jumped way beyond that at this point. Yeah. Um, again, I see him in the locker room after the game, giving the belt out. Um, and, and it's not that he's a rah-rah guy, he's never going to be that, but it, I listen for the things he says, and I just yeah. see, like, leader written all. I just see mature leader he's, and a guy. I mean, he skated 4.2 miles the other day in the game. I mean, come wild. on. Yeah. He plays yeah. goal line to goal line. It's astonishing. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think we talked about this last episode, the episode before, where – how critical the your off seasons are. Mm. Uh, I mean, Sandheim has just 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 had crazy off seasons the last two years in terms of the condition he, he's shown up in, and you see the dividends that has paid, um, the minutes he's been able to play. 
uh, and um, you know, just and, and I think too. I mean, I, I there there have been stretches, of course, where he's played well before, and, and some stretches where he's even last year's his first NHL double digit goals. But he he had, he had a level of like all around promise. Come, I remember when the Flyers drafted him, and um, Chris Pryor was still the still really up running the draft at the point with uh, with Ron Hextall. And, and I, I talked to Sarge, and he said, you know, there, there's not many players who have all all the S tools, right? The size, the skill, the speed. The, yeah, I mean, and and he said, you know, there, there's there's some rawness with Travis, but if he puts it all together, he'll have all of those things, and that's that's why they draft him 14th overall. And it, it's taken time, because it often takes with defensemen, but now now you're seeing that. Bill, if if this is what he is in his prime. And he's just hit his prime. Yeah, um, that's an an eight point five, eight point yeah. eight million dollar player that you're getting at six million dollars. Is yeah. he a number one if this is what he is in his prime? If if this is how he plays, it looks like it to me. <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, it, a, a guy who can on a given night give you thirty minutes, right? <laughs> uh, he play PP one uh, if you need him to. If you need him to. You know, or PP two otherwise, but I mean, he can play in every situation. Uh, a lot of this production that he has is coming at five on five, but he can play power play too, and he can um, play three on three. And he, you, well, you, you can use him in any man power situation. Yeah. That's the thing. And um, you know, when he when he was with the Calgary Hitmen, he was he was the best offensive defenseman in the league. Now, part of it was by necessity because they didn't have much in the way of forwards. But um, but he was always up on the attack, and then he had, yeah. then he had to adapt his game to the NHL level, really kind of learning, relearning how to play to a degree. Um, that's why he went down to the Phantoms and did, spent a year in the American League before he came back up. But there's there's always been a level of promise. There just hasn't been that uh, consistency level in, in in putting it all together. Where where Travis would he'd be up for a while, he'd be down a couple of weeks. I mean, you know, which, which is uh, to me, that's what a second pair defenseman is. A guy who might have the tools to play the first pair, but he doesn't have the consistency necessarily. Yeah. Yes. Right now he's absolutely a, a first pair guy and the way he's playing lately, that to me is an, is a number one defenseman. Yes. And if that can maintain to solve yeah. that problem from within makes you know, you still got to get centers and, and there's still yeah. other th- boxes to check that aren't easy. But if you can solve that one, that's a really hard one to solve. And frankly, I like the versatility of being able to play both sides because it gives yeah. you a lot of uh, vari- variable things that you can do. And John Tortorella, I know, mentioned that when they moved him to the right side, he saw the offensive zone differently with that stick in the middle of the yeah. ice. It's definitely a disadvantage defending off the rush, but in the offense, I, I said this to Cam York one time, Bill. I'm like, I'm surprised the team doesn't have a defenseman that play on the left side defensively and then move over to the right side offensively, like just well, crisscross yeah. as you go up the ice. Yeah, and that that was, uh, uh, you know, that was something I, I I do think that that Sandheim in his career because because he switched sides a little bit. Yeah, uh, going back to when he was. You know, he, he switched sides several times, but when when he was with uh, Ivan Provorov. For mm-hmm. for a while, for most of one year, he played the right side because Provorov, Provorov doesn't play the right side at all, and wouldn't. so so Travis would <laughs> Travis would would have to move over and, and play the right and um and also when, in in his pairing with uh, with Cam York, they 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 switched sides at, at one point. Yeah, they, they were trying initially. They were they were having uh, they were actually having uh, York on his offside. When, when he first came up, and then you know, then then he finally was like, "Nah, I, I, I just don't feel comfortable over here." Yeah, he, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, he, he, tried, he tried it; it didn't work, and yep. uh, they moved him over. But uh, yeah, I, I I think that I think offensively, um, Sandheim has always been a little bit better on, on the right side. Um, I think part of it's also the shooting angle is, is a little bit better for him, um, and. And defensively, I mean, the I mean, the big, of course, the big, the two biggest things are playing on the playing on your offside is you have to be comfortable on your backhand up the wall, yeah, you gotta be and strong. and then you have to be decisive because you're exposing the puck over the middle. Yeah. So it, it, if you're 
comfortable with that and decisive, it, it, it can work. But there are a lot of guys that, that really are not comfortable and never get comfortable with it. So it's definitely it's definitely a bonus that he can play either side and, and be comfortable doing it. For those wondering why it's an advantage for a left shot guy to be on the right in the offensive zone, if you're moving to the middle of the ice, you're leading with your stick. If you're trying to get to the middle of the ice as a left shot from the left side, yeah. you're backing along the blue line. It's much more difficult um, just to kind of lay that out real quick in, in case people were, were wondering that. Uh, Bill, big week ahead. A lot of hockey before a little bit of a break. Uh, Monday, uh, tonight, they'll be taking on Vegas to wrap up the, the homestand, and then they'll go Wednesday, quick trip to Nashville and exactly. back. Nashville has been in the kaputs. They've been horrible after a head-scratching offseason. Um, yeah. in my opinion, that Barry Trotz pulled off and boy, it's backfired in a big way. Uh, then we'll have Thanksgiving on Thursday, Friday, huge black Friday game against the rags. And then Saturday, uh, yeah. the next back to back in St. Louis, a couple of time changes in there too, but a big yeah. week ahead for him. Oh yeah. So, I mean, well, four games in six nights, Yep, tough opponents, um, no time to practice. Obviously if you, if you're, uh, you're traveling, you're playing or you're traveling, and yeah. as you said, there, there's time zone changes involved. Uh, um, definitely, you know, definitely one of the toughest stretches of the season. And to me, and 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 Chris Terry has said this too. You know, back to back is no big deal. Sometimes you feel better in the second game, but when you're doing three and four, and then when you get to four and six, that's when you really have to fight for energy because it it, it piles up. It's compounding. It's and St. Louis ain't around the corner. Yeah, exactly. If it's back to back and you're busting it to the Prudential Center or you're taking yeah. a train to DC, it's not that bad. Yeah. Um, going all the way out to St. Louis, um, it will be no, you know, don't discount on that one. All right, that's going to put a wrap on this episode of Flyer da Flyers Daily. Rebuilds work at NHL.com and uh, PhiladelphiaFlyers.com, and we'll be back tomorrow. Danny Briere will be our guest on tomorrow's brand new Flyers Daily.